Our lesson today comes from the book of Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah is considered to be one of the greatest of the um, writing prophets. One often quoted in the New Testament, maybe more often than any other, and quoted very frequently by Jesus himself. In order for a background for you to understand the message today, you have to realize that the book of Isaiah was written during a very tumultuous and difficult time for Israel. Life was hard and the future was bleak for the Israelites. They were exhausted and they were burdened from the circumstances of life. The, script, the passage today starts off by saying, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded from my God. That's kind of a different kinds of term to say, where are you, God? If you see all of our problems and all of our trouble, are you not paying attention? And if you're paying attention and you see it, why can't you do something about it? Or maybe you can't do something about it. And so then we have Isaiah's response to their complaints. And so if you have your Bible today, which I doubt you do, <laughs> Or if you have your phone and you want to turn to Isaiah 40, beginning with verse 27, the Israelites were complaining and griping and doubting God. They were doubting God's ability or his interest in them as far as not doing anything about their situation. And so he says, do you not know, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no man can fathom. He kind of puts it to him. And sometimes I have to ask myself, when I'm down, when I'm struggling with something, I have to ask myself, Nancy, <laughs> do you not know, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? And of course, then I have to say, yeah, of course I know that. Of course I know it. Of course I believe it with all of my heart. And then I have to ask myself another question. Then why are you grappling and grumbling? And why are you wondering why God isn't answering your prayers in just the way that you want him to answer your prayer? Can you not trust this God who is the creator, creator of the ends of the earth, who does not grow tired and weary? Can you not trust him with what is going on and understand that he is always at work on your behalf? In other words, if you know you've got God and the universe is on your, the God of the universe on your side, then what are we grumpy and grumbling about? How could we possibly be doubting God's power? If I get to thinking that God doesn't care, I remember the, the line and his understanding no man can fathom. That's an interesting word. We don't use that a whole lot anymore. But God's understanding of us is so complete and so amazing that we cannot even start to grasp it because God is the all-knowing, all-seeing God. He knows so much more about our situation than we know about it. He can see the beginning and he can see the end and he can see the middle and he can see what he's doing to work everything out for us even though we can't. And so, yes, is he interested in us? Absolutely. Does he care? Absolutely. Is he capable of doing something about it? Absolutely. He does not grow tired or weary. We do, but God does it. When we're sound asleep, God is wide awake, taking care of us and at work on our behalf 24 hours a day. And then he says he gives streaks to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Anybody identify that? Have you ever been weary? <laughs> Have you ever felt weak? When we think of being weary, we always think of being physically weary. And of course, that's part of it. We could say, you know, we've worn, we're worn out. Um, however, we can also be weary emotionally. We're just tired of a situation. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. And we can be weary even of doing good things. Maybe we're weary of doing the same thing over and over. I remember when we lived in Montana, Mike was out one day shoveling snow, and he came in and he said, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that if it would just stay done. 
And I said, now you know about housework. You know, we get tired of doing the same thing over and over again. We're weary of trying to make ends meet. We're weary of dealing with neighbors or relatives or other people who are uh, less than joyful to be around. And we get, may get weary, but here again, God never gets weary. He's the endless source of strength, and he gives it to us graciously if, if we just ask him to do that. Remember Paul. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Those are strong words. He didn't specify what his thorn in the flesh was, and of course, we've always wanted to know. Theologians, some theologians surmise, and I've heard that he had some kind of eye problem, that his eyes ooze some kind of some kind of gunky stuff. Um, I don't know where they got that, but that's one of the theories. Um, others think that maybe his thorn in the flesh was people or a person. And for sure, we all know that the, the Jewish leaders followed him around doing everything they could possibly do to keep him from preaching and teaching the word of Jesus. So he could have been referring to them. Others think, because this, the scripture says, to keep me from being conceited, he gave me the thorn in the flesh. In other words, with all of Paul's, if you ever wondered, you know, with all of the revelations that God gave to Paul and with all of the leading and guiding one-on-one -on -one, that Paul might have fallen into a typical problem of being prideful about it. It would be pretty human for him to do that, that, well, I'm more holy than the rest of you because it looks like God has told me. So maybe the thorn in the flesh that people think might be his struggle with pride and, uh, and not being as humble as he would like to have been. We could identify with all of these. We become weary of dealing with health issues we become, um, we get tired of people who are a burr in our saddle. Uh, and we all have temptations to sin that plague us. But God does not get tired or weary. Paul said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. I love that scripture. I use it all the time. When I am weak, then God can be strong in me. And so when we are weak in a real wonderful way, it's a good thing. Because then when we know we're weak, then we call on the Lord and his strength can boost us up when our strength is gone. But the key is we have to tap into it. We have to ask for it. We have to, we have to get close to the Lord so that he knows that so that we know that when he answers our prayers, that, it's, that it was an answer to prayer, not just, well, that was lucky or, or um, you know, that was, that was a coincidence. But God would like to know that we appreciate, that we understand that the answers to our prayer are the answers to our prayer, not just coincidence and not just luck. I remember I heard a story a long time ago about a pastor who was having a big revival. He had some big speaker who was coming, and he knew his little church wasn't going to be able to hold the big crowd that was going to come. And sure enough, during the revival, just scores of people came, and there wasn't room in the church. People were standing in the aisles. They were standing in the background, in the lobby. They were at the windows, peering through the windows because there was no place to sit. So not too long after, the pastor died, and he went to heaven, and St. Peter was showing him around heaven, and they came to this warehouse. They just had thousands and thousands of chairs, and the pastor said, wait a minute. I had this revival, and I needed chairs, and I couldn't find them, and you had all these chairs. Why didn't you send us the chairs we needed? And St. Peter said, you didn't ask. <laughs> and I think sometimes we have the same problem. We don't ask. James 4.2 says, you have not because you ask not. It is the Lord's delight to answer our prayers. But we've got to, we've got to say the prayer. We've got not just say it. I don't like that term. We've got to pray the prayer. We've got to talk to the Lord uh, 
and communicate with him because that's where relationship is built. So then Isaiah goes on to reassure us that literally everybody needs strength at the same time. He says, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. I read that and I go, well, I wonder where that leaves us if young men grow tired and weary and, and stumble and fall. Um, you know, you ever go to the doctor and the first thing they say was, have you fallen in the last six months? <laughs> even young men stumble and fall, which gives us hope. And then it says, Isaiah says, but those who wait upon the Lord, those who wait up on the Lord, wait. Is that, that is one of the most unpopular words in the English language, I dare to say. You know, nobody likes to wait. You know, you're driving down the freeway, you come up to a signal light, and immediately you start doing the deal about, you know, which line is shorter, this line is shorter, but that, um, but it has a bus in it, maybe I better get in this line so I could take off, you know, three seconds sooner than the other line. We go to the grocery store and we, we stroll up and down looking at all the, all the um, open registers to see which line is going to be the shortest because we do not like to wait. Um, we go to the doctor and have a test and we get the test done and then what happens? We wait a week to get the results of the test. Nobody likes to wait. And so what does this mean? He who waits upon the Lord. You know, are you thinking, I don't want to wait upon the Lord. I want an answer right now. Well, the King James and the New King James translate the word wait. But the NIV and a few others translate the word hope. And still others transferred the word trust. And I think maybe all three words together kind of give a whole picture of what God is asking us to do. It's not that we pray and expect an answer immediately, although sometimes it may come. But those who look expectantly toward the Lord, you pray and you keep praying for as long and you keep expecting and knowing and trusting that the answer is going to come. That's what he means by those who wait upon the Lord. And then it says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings like eagles. Now, what is that all about? I did a little research about eagles that I'd like to share. One of the, one of the amazing ones is that the wingspan of an eagle is like seven feet. Seven feet. Can you imagine? Seven feet is the wingspan. Eagles mate for life when they're about four or five years old. And they build nests together. And the nest they build, a typical nest, is like two to four feet in diameter. And it's two to three feet deep. Huge. And they, because they mate for life, they keep building to the nest. And it gets bigger and bigger. Um... Females are larger than males. I don't know what that signifies, but that's just what it said. Um, their eyesight, I like this one, their eyesight is four to five times better than our eyesight. They can see like two miles away. They can see prey two miles away. And I can't read the box, <laughs> the instructions on the box. So they're probably more than four or five times my vision. Amazing. And this is the one that really got me. They can soar to heights of 10,000 to 15,000 feet. We lived in Denver for five years, and I learned that a mile in the Mile High City is 5280. And so if they can, if they can soar 10,000 to 15,000 feet in the air, that's two miles, or more than two miles. And you think, how do they do that? You know, how do they breathe up there? God has gifted them with a special, some kind of transition where they can breathe in that very, very thin air, which comes in handy as a story I'll tell you in a minute. You notice that eagles soar effortlessly, allowing the wind to propel them upwards. They just seem to float in the air. Most other birds flap their wings, you know. <clears throat> when you see a flock of geese flying over, you notice that they are continually flapping their wings to keep them 
um, up and to keep them moving forward. Um, by the way, did you, do you know why when you see a flock of geese go over, do you know why there's always one, they're in a V, why one side of the V is always longer than the other? You may know, there's more birds in that line. <laughs> So I ask you, are you flapping or soaring? <laughs> are you flapping or soaring? I, and, and I think we probably do some of both, but I would say on a normal day, are you more of a flapper or a soarer? Um, are you flapping like crazy in an attempt to, to keep afloat, keep everything going, and you're using your own strength in order to try to accomplish what you think you need to get done? Or are you resting in the Lord's strength and soaring effortlessly with him? And then I, I told you that about the height that an eagle could go to. The only bird that dares attack an eagle is a crow. And the crow sits on the back of an eagle and pecks at his, the back of his neck to try to bring him down. And the eagle doesn't try to knock him off. He doesn't twist and turn and soar or anything like that. The eagle just keeps on going up and up and up and up until he gets way up in the thin air. And then guess what happens? The crow falls off because he can't breathe. And so we could take that as a spiritual application. You know, sometimes when things come against us, we don't need to try to knock it off and get all upset and in a whirl tailspin to get it undone. Maybe we just need to soar more and more and more closely to the Lord and let the Lord take care of it for us. Another thing, um, an eagle will deliberately seek out a storm rather than avoid it. In order to become airborne, an eagle waits for a large atmospheric gust of wind called a thermal, and it, uh, it knows by enduring the temporary adversity of the high wind that he will soar above the storm into what is the clear, clean, still air. The storm is what propels him upwards. It's almost Thanksgiving. So, for a minute, let's compare an eagle to a turkey. <laughs> what happens when a turkey, when a storm is coming? Anybody know what the turkey does? He runs under the barn. <laughs> he runs to get away from it. He knows a storm may be coming, he wants no part of it, and so he goes and hides in order to be safe. And so you see a turkey runs and hides, you knows nothing to do with the storm, whereas the eagle uses the storm to boost him upward over the, over the rough spots into the clean sailing area. And so you can see how that is another, another message for us that when the storm comes, we need to greet it head on with the strength of the Lord to carry us up and through and over it rather than running and hiding and trying to escape. If we choose to wait on God and rely on him as our source of strength, as the eagle relies on the wind current, we can conserve our energy by allowing God to direct our paths. And we will renew our strength, as scripture says. You get the picture of an eagle soaring with its powerful wings, its strength, its boldness, its serenity, its majesty, its confidence. The eagle owns the skies. And finally, Isaiah says, those who wait upon the Lord will run and not be merry, weary. I don't think Isaiah's running is, I don't think Isaiah is referring to a marathon, at least I hope not. He's comparing the road God has set before us spiritually to running a race, just like the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 when he said, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. And so when Isaiah says, run and not be weary, he's saying you get endurance, that you just keep on keeping on, because God gives us the strength to do that. And then Isaiah says, we will walk and not faint. Sometimes we are charging ahead like gangbusters, and other times we just need to slow down 
and take things at a walk, but we're all still moving forward. We don't quit. We're still moving forward. I like the phrase, keep, uh, just do the next right thing. Just do the next right thing. And so what have we said? We said when things are overwhelming and you wonder if God is paying any attention at all, remember who God is, the creator of the ends of the earth. Remember what he's like. He doesn't get tired or weary. He's always on the job night and day. He understands us. He's completely aware of our struggle and he is always at work causing all things to work together for our good. Remember that when we wait and hope and trust in the Lord, that he can cause our storms of life to propel us to new heights with him in just the same way that the eagle uses storms to launch him into the air. Stop being a turkey and start being an eagle. Stop flapping and start soaring. So how do we soar? While we wait on the Lord, we trust in the Lord and hope in the Lord in complete confidence that he is always at work in our behalf. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves. And when you start to doubt that the Lord knows, understands, and is at work for you, ask yourself, do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow tired or weary and his understanding no man can fathom.